So I'm Ryan Kaufman. I'm the VP of Narrative at Jam City, and this talk is titled Narrative Nuances in Mobile Games. I do have two caveats. Um, first of all, it is early. I realize it's only 10 a.m., but I do swear a lot. So just so you know, don't be shocked. There are cusses in this presentation. Um, and I am sorry, I will do my best not to do that shit. And second, it is totally okay to laugh at my shitty graphics. I am a writer, I am not a graphic designer, um, and so there's some stuff in there that you might think maybe a child got a hold of my presentation or a chimpanzee or something like that, and it's okay to laugh. I do like a really cheesy Google Slides transition, so enjoy. A bit about who I am, um, just briefly, I started at LucasArts back in 6000 BC when we made games out of sticks and rocks and it was really cool. Um, and I was in QA and then a designer and then I started to write. So I do come to writing from a design perspective. So interactive story is something that's always been in my head. How do we make stories that people can play? Um, after that, I was at a place called Planet Moon and we did some sort of co-op and kids games. So I started to broaden what I thought of as the audience. It wasn't just Star Wars people with lightsabers and pew pew anymore. It was like kids and parents and, and playing together and having a story experience together. After that, I was at Telltale Games for eight years. I worked on The Walking Dead. Uh, I was creative lead on Wolf Among Us and Game of Thrones. In addition to being the narrative director there, um, and so, you know, making those games really helped hone the craft of what is interactive story, what does choice mean, how do you play something, how do you feel uh, these emotions that the character's feeling. Um, and I, de I developed sort of a curriculum about that, and I gave these seminars to the writers and the designers. And a lot of that is in this presentation, so these are not just theoretical things, but these are actually some battle-tested techniques that you can take away from this presentation and use because um, I know they do work to some extent. And then most recently I came to Jam City and um, that's been really interesting to be engaged with a totally new audience. So in addition to like Harry Potter, we also have games that are super casual like Panda Pop and um, Cookie Jam and our audience is uh, comprised of all sorts of different people. So it's been really interesting to develop stories for people I'm um, I'm not used to developing and that games sometimes ignore. So that's, that's been really great. Um, for this presentation, um, I did a lot of research. And by research, I mean I spent a lot of time looking at Twitter. And, because that's easier than researching. And at one point, I came across this quote and I thought, this really encapsulates, I think, what our struggle is right now. And that is, we have to deliver all this information and we've only really got to the point where we can dress it up a little bit about with, you know, we really need to get across, give me 12 ram horns for a plus three sword, but we can kind of gild the lily a bit with the uh, gravid plane and the codicils and realm voids and all that stuff. But is it any better? Um, I mean, that's the question. Boom, look at that, pretty cool. Um, the, <laughs> This is the question I want to address in this presentation. We're gonna talk about why it hasn't gotten that much better um, on the whole. And I think to start with, maybe it's something to do with how we view our jobs. So I think we often start with this assumption that we, the writers, um, need to transmit the story to the player who is essentially like a reader. There's a lot of information to cover and you know, we need to include backstory and plot and oh, more backstory and characters, oh, you should have those locations, yes. Critical detail, why not more backstory? World building, A plots, B plots, Z plots, a whole bunch of stuff needs to get shoved into our story. And the experience can be very unequal on either side of that arrow. And on our side, we're like sitting there thinking, we're like Mary Shelley, we've invented a new genre because um, we've given all this amazing lore. But on the other side, on the player side, it can be different. It can be kind of like, what, who? And we have to be careful about that. And there's some techniques I'm gonna cover to help connect people to that information we're trying to give them. We labor under maybe 
a fantasy, that if you pair a well-written story with a reasonable player, you're gonna get this love affair, and this love affair is gonna last forever. Like these two crazy kids, I think it's gonna work. But all too often, because we're making them drink for the fire hose, the reaction is more like, yeah, okay, I don't get it, bye. I'm not connected to this game. So I see instead of an arrow, I see it more like a virtuous circle. And it starts with the things that we are going to give. We are going to give emotional story, we're gonna give character relationships, participatory art, compelling choices, and that the players are gonna come back with, when they, see, when they experience their emotional story, they're gonna come back with emotional investment. They react to the character relationships with like their ships and their memes and all that cool stuff. And the art becomes cosplay. And the choices become tears and, and loyalty and I'm coming back and I'm playing season two or, or whatever. But we have to sustain this circle because that's how we create the connection. And the connection is extremely important. The connection is what brings people back. The connection is what builds loyalty or builds investment um, and even monetization. And if you come away from this talk with one idea in your head, if everything I babble about just like goes completely one, in one ear out the other, um, remember this, connection is better than information. Information is just data. Your job as writers is to form a connection. You are artists. You are looking inside of your own heart so that you can connect with someone else's heart. Information is just, that's for robots. You're not robots. The people playing these games are not robots. We have to strive for something deeper than that. Information will take care of itself if people feel connected to what you're trying to get at. So this is the big takeaway. You can leave now if you want. Um, I just gave it all away. I just wanted to underline this. I'm really sorry I couldn't make it blink. Um, I'll do better next time. All right, so now that I've established kind of my, my, my large goals, let's talk about actual techniques. And I'm gonna drive through about six proven things I know can work and that you can take away and apply to your own games and your own narratives. First, there's right story for right audience, crafting payoffs, something I call writing for the triangle, compelling choices, and sharing is caring. And I realized that I said there were six, and so I'm gonna include a bonus, there will be a cat. Um, this comes because um, when I used to give these seminars for the writers and designers at Telltale, the only time we could do it was at lunch, and I knew that they were sitting out there angry that I had taken away their lunch. So I would always promise them, hey, no matter what is boring stuff is in my slideshow, I will include a picture of a cute kitty. And that tended to mollify them. So I've, I continue to use that and, and, and it might work on you too, hopefully. Oh God, I love transitions. Um, so right story for the right audience. This is where it often begins and it can go wrong right from the start. You have to know who your audience is and you have to know what they care about. I think sometimes we assume we know. Um, I was in a room recently with some devs who were kind of like blue sky, blue sky brainstorming, what is our game gonna be like? And they were throwing out references. They were like, I love you know um, Mario Kart and I kind of want it to be like that and like um, Super Smash Bros and playing a lot of that. So they were drawing in all these like really credible references mainly from sort of those Nintendo products, and I said, I said, well, but okay, so who's our audience? And they said, oh, it's like women aged um, 50 to 60, and I went, it's totally possible that these women would get those references, but we didn't ask anybody, and they just assumed they knew, and I think that's where it often goes wrong, is that it needs to start with a conversation. You need to go to your audience, first of all, identify your audience. Second, go to them, ask them, what are you into, what do you value? Or what are you looking for in a game? Because it's totally possible that you could come to the table with some really credible pitch that included a lot of high quality references like, it's gonna be like True Detective wrapped in the best parts of Jessica Jones and in a gritty fantasy setting with real political intrigue. And like, that sounds really cool. Um, but what if your audience is like, <laughs> they don't get those references, those values are not important to them. So you sort of wasted everybody's time 
And it's easy to get caught up in what you love, but remember, there's a second part of that equation. And what can help you with this are, for a long time we talked about demographics, and demographics are now seen as kind of limited, like males 18 to 35. Well, a male 18 to 35, an 18 year old male could be just getting out of high school, and a 35 year old male could be like, have kids and own his own house, and their values and what they're looking for are not really aligned. So now we talk more about segmentation, and there have been a couple of great talks, so I won't go over segmentation too much, but it's really more about thinking, um, slicing through that entire demographic and looking more for personality traits or like play styles or goals, um, what your audience is looking for. So like, as an example, we did for Panda Pop recently, um, we were thinking about what if we had a more robust story in Panda Pop? Because there kind of isn't a story, it's very suggested. So we went to the audience and we talked to a lot, you know, we talked to men, we talked to women, all ages, and we sliced um, sort of one demographic and did a little deep dive on like, what do you like about this game? Like, what are you looking for when you, when you get into Panda Pop? And there were three groups, and first of all, it was a skill group, and these women were really interested in, they wanted high scores, um, they love to discover strategies, so like how to bank the, you know, like the bubble and, and understanding the mechanics and using all the various like weaponry and stuff. They were super skill based. And then there was a the second group, and they were more resonating with the content. They liked the cute pandas. They liked the magical world. That's what was getting them back into the game. And then the third group was the escape group, like the. Uh, this is my stress relief, this is my me time. It was a little place they could go to get away from it all. Um, and that was really instructive for thinking about the story because it automatically gives you a sense of who your story might appeal to and or, even better, we started to think about how could we include some of these elements in the story so that players could feel they were reflected somehow, like could some of the pandas be very like skill-minded pandas who take pride in how well they do. And we're not the only people who think about this. I mean, Netflix, I thought this was interesting. They talk about taste communities and you can see it in their ads right now. Um, they have a bunch of ads where like a bunch of really disparate looking people are all sitting around like watching Umbrella Academy and like, I think that's really real. I mean, both my daughter and I really enjoyed that show for completely different reasons. But when you think more about segmentation than demographics, it opens up, again, avenues for connection. You're trying to connect with people, you have to know what they're looking for. So the ideal way to conceive a story, this is a graphic you can laugh at. Um, I do that with my finger, guys. So, <laughs> It should start with the stuff you love. I don't want you to come away from this talk thinking, Ryan told me you can't, like, I can't do what I love. Please, start with what you love. It has to start from something real, and that something is probably in your heart or from your life. Um, but don't forget to include the stuff they love, too, and know what that is. Don't guess at it, go ask. And the sweet spot is the, <laughs> is the pink squiggly bit. And the pink squiggly bit is so important to know because that's where your game story should live. And um, I would love for that quote to get taken out of context. <laughs> pink squiggly bit. So now that you have pink squiggly bit and you kind of know what the values are, what kind of story should you tell? Um, why don't we go to the old hoary chestnut? Uh, what about the hero's journey? Okay, it's an incredible story template. You have, you know, what does it look like? Well, it's got a call to action, there's an arc. You know, there's shenanigans in the middle where you have adventures and fight monsters and stormtroopers. And then there's a resolution where there's a big conflict and the hero learns something about herself and changes. And that works really well because it maps really well or has mapped really well to like AAA single player type of games where you're gonna start with a tutorial. It's like, how do I get involved? And then there's gonna be a mid game and so that's all your levels. Um, and then there's the final boss who comes in and you fight and the game ends and boom. It kind of maps nicely over the top. But we're in a different era now. So free to play kind of looks more like this, doesn't it? You have your Fatui and then there's like, you start churning through those levels and you get like level 500 and level 1000, but it just keeps kind of pointing out. 
infinitely. So that doesn't look like the hero's journey. There's no arc, there's no resolution. So then what? what? What kind of story is this? I say, consider the humble sitcom structure. I mean, sitcoms are built like this. They start with um, a cast of characters, and they don't know how many seasons they're going to go. So they really have to build the story to be somewhat pliably uh, infinite. <clears throat> and their structure looks more like this, where you have all these ups and downs. And they're way more frequent, which we know suits a mobile environment a lot better. So I'm not saying you have to. I'm saying consider. This is, this is a really interesting possibility. Um, and I'll make one more play for it. I'm not being paid by the sitcom industry or anything like that. I just really see that there's potential here. First of all, um, sitcoms are based on characters with unresolvable dilemmas. You know, like Leslie Nope is always going to be naively optimistic. She's not going to change. Joey's never going to turn into a rocket scientist. Um, Ron Swanson is never going to believe in government. Like, <clears throat> but that's fine. That's what we want out of that entertainment. And putting those characters in conflict is how you generate stories over and over and over. And it can scale infinitely. They also have clear act breaks. So every sitcom, if it's a half an hour, it's got three act breaks. And that also gives you a really nice rhythm. Um, and it's something that you can map onto your own stories. They're smaller, producible arcs. It's not like a gigantic 60-hour mega arc. You can do a smaller iterations on that. Um, and the scenes tend to be character-based. I mean, you could do most sitcom scenes in a room, an empty room with two chairs and two characters. That could be a sitcom scene. It's totally doable. And that's way closer to uh, how we need to produce things in mobile. It has to be somewhat cheap, somewhat easy to produce, and quick. We have a lot of content to put out. And so if you look at sitcoms, there's a nice parallel there. But don't forget, do fit your content to its format, especially if you're working with a big IP. So for example, what I mean is, in Harry Potter, we have like the books have these amazing set piece adventure things, you know, the lake of fire with a million zombies coming out and attacking them. Um, the movies do this too, because they're visual medium and movies have to be a spectacle. However, with Hogwarts um, mystery, we knew we needed to be somewhat more contained and smaller, um, but still feel very meaningful and connected. So, Hogwarts mystery is all about characters. There's a million characters and you meet them all and they have different personalities and putting those personalities into a room together is how we drive the drama. We don't do it with giant you know, set pieces, we do it with character drama. And that's because we're fitting the content to the format. All right, number two, crafting payoffs. Okay, so now that you've got your audience in the door and you've you're telling them the right story, how do you keep them there? Regular narrative payoffs bond a player to a game. What you want to do is establish a habit or establish an expectation of this payoff that's going to come. And you need to do that by starting with emotional storytelling, not informational storytelling. You will never hook anybody with a bunch of data about, here's, a, here's some plot points and a list of planets you're going to visit. Nobody cares. They just don't. Remember what I said, connection is better than information. Start with a connection. And that means starting with a theme, because themes are what people feel. A theme is a really easy way to explain to people how they're supposed to feel about your game or feel in your game. And you have to know what it is. I can't tell you how many devs I've talked to that they would explain their story. You go here, you go there. And I'm like, OK, that sounds cool. But like, what's your theme? What's the theme of the game? And just blank look. Like, just haven't thought about it. So think about it. Um, examples of themes are like, when we were doing Game of Thrones, we talked with um, some people who knew George R. R. Martin, and we talked a lot about this idea of your passions will destroy you. And that's a theme that runs all the way through Game of Thrones. And we see characters who, you know, like Rob Stark, spoilers, um, his passion for his father, that, that loyalty drives him to pursue revenge, which leads to his death and the death of a lot of people he loves. And that kind of thing you see all over the place. And in mobile, it kind of, I was trying to think of examples of this in mobile, and I thought of Donut County, and um, kind of tickled me, because I think uh, it's, it's applicable to what we do, too. 
Romance is always a good one. Romance is something we all understand. Um, at some point in our lives, we engage with it personally. And it's a really powerful driver for players, too. And there are a lot of games out right now that engage in romance. Um, and even in Potter, we're sort of starting to explore that, too, as the kids get older. We just did our celestial ball. Um, so that was, and that was well received by the fans. Redemption, especially Redemption Interrupted. So with Walking Dead, we had Lee, and that whole first season was all about redemption interrupted. And it's very tragic and sad, and, and it makes you cry. And actually, sadness is a powerful theme, and it's something that I think, especially in mobile, we're scared of. Um, mobile is traditionally very conservative when it comes to content, because we don't want to scare anyone off. However, I've seen it work in games like Lily's Garden, where I take a pretty common trope of the, the kind of homescapes like builders, and that is that a relative has died and left you this giant estate. And the story ends up being about like the estate that you renovate instead of like, wait, somebody died? Like, did I love them? Does, am I sad about that? And I think Lily's Garden does a great job of bringing that grief back in a way that's not oppressive, but it feels real and three-dimensional. So props to them. Now that you have theme, you have to think about cadence. Like I said, you want to establish a habit. And you don't want to give them the extended edition with the beards that go to the floor when all they want is like Seinfeld. They want a quick experience. They might, because you've done your research and you know what your audience wants. So for Telltale, um, just quickly, we had sort of a 90 to 120 minute experience. And every episode ended with a big cliffhanger. And it was followed by a next time on, which was essentially a tease for the next thing. So we knew we would have an emo at least one big emotional payoff. And then interspersed, we had what we called the big five. And those were like smaller payoffs. And those would happen about every 15 minutes or so. So, excuse me. Um, so this is kind of like what the cadence looked like for a typical Telltale episode. And every 15 minutes worked for that format because we knew people were probably sitting on their couch. They were pretty dedicated to trying to finish the episode. We weren't competing for their attention as much. With Potter, we have these things called time-limited side quests. And those tend to be sort of one big theme that is chopped into maybe six to eight chapters, and each chapter takes place in a location, and they're about 10 minutes each. So it's, way, it's a smaller time slice. And each chapter is a mini cliffhanger about halfway through. And that mini cliffhanger tends to come in the form of a question. Um, it's usually they're trying to do, solve some mystery or you know, figure out ingredients for a potion or something like that. So it's like a what is question, like what is you know, ingredient X? And then they go and they work on it. And this is where the player spends their energy. And that always ends with a payoff, which is the, okay, now we know, we figured it out. And that pivots the scene to what's next. And each chapter usually has a choice, and it's often a role play choice. So you, guess you get at least one moment of forming a relationship or changing a relationship with a character. And then it ends with a hint of what's next. So in some senses, it is kind of like a mini version of, of the Telltale Cadence, or like most dramatic, um, episodic, uh, uh, format. So it kind of looks like this. And there you go. And I drew that with my finger too, so I'm very proud of it. Um, so you can see this actually, if you, if you blew it up and copy pasted it, it would kind of look like that telltale thing. But what's important about both of those examples is that was very much codified by the teams. These are like rules. They were always something we would evaluate and say, do we have our big payoff? Um, for Potter, it's like, do we have the scene pivot and do we have something to, to send players off to the next location? So making it more of a formal structure is really important to make sure you're not missing that and that you're creating that habit. And remember that this is a retention tool. Like, once you form a habit, don't, don't let it go. Like, that's really tough. So be consistent and deliver on the promise of your theme. It's important to deliver on that promise. And speaking of promise, hey, what about that cat? You told us there was a cat. And frankly, I don't think you deserve the cat yet. Um, that's just me. That's how I'm feeling. You can't force me. 
All right, so now that we've got our audience, we've got some sort of cadence, now let's talk about this notion of writing for the triangle. And this is a really easy technique to take and use yourself, or at least be aware of when you're doing it. A lot of times we have dialogue between two NPCs. And they can be really cool NPCs. They can be very well written. Of course they are because you guys are great writers. And um, you're, you know, you got Cersei and she's very interesting and evil and she's gonna say something cool. And Tyrion is super funny and witty and he's gonna say something cool. So we spend all our dramatic energy in that conversation between these two characters because we know it's gonna be fun and fireworks. <laughs> What we forget about, though, is like the player. The player's sitting there, and it's now non-interactive. I mean, and that's fine for TV. That's fine for movies. That's what we expect. But if they're sitting there with a phone in their hand, they do want a little bit of that interactivity. So are we forming a connection? No. This is information. This is one way. So even the best dialogue then becomes, kind of lands in that information bucket. So how do you fix this? This is a really common way to do it. And we did it in Harry Potter. This is an example of, of how it works. Um, this is Penny, and Penny's currently engaged in a project to create decorations. Um, and her teacher, Professor Flitwick, has told her, you are not to use magic to create these decorations. And she follows rules. So she is of the opinion we shouldn't use magic to uh, enhance the decorations. So character one states an opinion. Then you have character two. And character two usually has the opposite opinion, or at least a different opinion. This is all well and good. Then the two characters turn to the main character, the player, and ask an opinion. They solicit participation. They solicit the opinion. And I want you to note the positions of these characters, because that's what I'm talking about. We're starting to form that triangle physically. You're telling the player that they are part of what's going on. And the camera work here reinforces that. Um, and then we allow for actual input. So here's the interface, and the choice then becomes, let's use magic or don't use magic. And here's, an, here's the most important thing that I think people forget about a lot, feedback. So the narrative solicits your input and then gives you feedback to say, I heard what you said, I saw what you valued, your opinion matters, and now the narrative has changed somewhat because of that. We're acknowledging it. And in this sense, it was done nicely through, um, through the narrative itself. There wasn't you know, an, an on, on, on screen UI or anything like that. This is actually one of the characters saying, oh yeah, because the character, you know, Hermione told us not to. So what we're really doing there is we're taking some of that dramatic energy that we usually invest in an NPC dialogue and using some of that energy to solicit player input. And then we're using some more of that energy to create narrative feedback. So you can call that branching or whatever, but you're forming that triangle with the player. They are involved in this conversation. And so that's where the triangle comes from. And that's where you get that connection because now they're invested in this conversation. They had some input. Um, they're interested to see what happens next. So now that we've got them talking to the game, how do we create those choices that are compelling? Because not all choices are created equal. I'll tell you this, good choices are a sleight of hand. What you're really doing as devs, as creators, is you're implanting ideas in the player's head. And then at a key moment, you ask them for their opinion and you put those, those topics on screen as if the player thought of them themselves. What? That's the best form of a choice because it feels like the player is like, oh yeah, this is what I was thinking of anyway. And they should feel like they are organically arise from the player's own mind. And you can contrast this with choices that arise externally, like from an author. So for instance, if I said, um, guys, what's your favorite flavor of ice cream? And then I listed your options and I said, pistachio, chunky monkey, and banana. Like those are technically ice creams, but it's probably not what you were thinking. It's probably not even close to the range of stuff you were thinking about. 
And that can feel very much like an authored choice or an inorganic choice. And what I should have said was probably something like chocolate, strawberry, and vanilla, like fairly safe, like probably something that was in your head. So setting that context and setting the parameters for what that choice could look like is really important too, because that's how you narrow the field to something that you can control and use that sleight of hand magic to make it all seem very seamless. And the last thing to do is to strive to find room for personal expression in the choices. So remember, you're not conducting a survey. You're really trying to elicit some kind of personal expression, some sort of emotion from the player, because again, that's where your connection is gonna come from. If, if, if the answer is coming from their heart, you're probably in a really good place. You've really connected with them. Uh, and by the way, so monetization and premium choices fuck all this shit up, so um, I will get to that later, but let's just put that to one side for now. Um, anyway, I wanna illustrate kind of what I'm talking about. It's, it's fairly subtle, and so we'll do a fake case study. This does not exist anywhere, but it's, I made it up for this, and it's called the Draco Malfoy beatdown. So let's say we're in a Harry Potter game, um, and we get a prompt from the game as players, and it says, Draco Malfoy is coming down the hallway. What do you do? There he is. And your choices are duck into a broom closet, take out your wand and attack, and make friends. Now these are all choices that like don't break reality, but do they feel organic? I say no. I think there are, there's a lot wrong with this range of choices. First of all, like the detail of the broom closet came completely from me, the author. Like I didn't say anything about the broom closet when I said Draco Malfoy is coming down the hallway. Um, so in order to, in introducing that into the choice space is bizarre, like not what you were thinking, right? Taking out your wand and attacking, I guess so, but is he doing anything aggressive? Why would, why would a player be reacting that way? They wouldn't, it's totally a suggestion from me, the author. And also the parameters are completely wide open. The question is, what would you do? Or what do you do? I mean, there's a million things I could do. I could run away, I could like run up and kiss him. Like, why aren't those represented here? So the choice piece is really, really problematic. And finally, there's no personal expression. Why would I be expressing any of these? And what does it have to do with how I'm feeling? There's no prompts for how to feel about Draco Malfoy coming down the hallway. It's too neutral, it's too wide open. So this choice, is super problematic in a lot of ways, but we can fix it. First of all, let's give a little more context and a smaller parameter to the prompt. So here he is, he's looking a little more aggressive. Let's change it to Draco Malfoy challenges you to a duel in the hallway, but you know dueling is against the rules. What do you do? Accept the duel, refuse the duel, or tell him I'll meet you later at the bike racks. We'll go out behind Hagrid's hut and um, you know, off school grounds and I'll kick your ass there. So we're closer. This is more organic. It's probably, when I said challenges you to a duel, you were probably thinking something like, oh, we're gonna fight, or I'm not gonna fight. So that binary is more organic. But it is also very philosophical because of the whole thing of, you know, it's against the rules. Well, rules didn't come from you. Rules aren't inside of your heart. Rules are something that are, again, external. Um, and there might be moments when following the rules is, is, is something emotionally engaging, but not here. The parameters are closed, so we really narrowed the field by saying you challenge to a duel, um, so the choices do feel a little more natural. The deferment choice is not great. Really, the meet later at the bike racks is just a way of saying, uh, let's return to this exact same choice later. And that doesn't really do anything for your story or for the player. So the final suggestion would be, how could we make this a more personal, player-centric question? And here's my attempt to do that. So now we could change this to, uh, Malfoy challenges you to a duel in front of your new crush, who then offers to defend you. And your choices are, fight Malfoy yourself, I got this. Um, leave without fighting, way of the peaceful warrior. Let your crush defend you. And then it does sort of suggest a fourth one, which is beat his ass together. So like, <laughs> this is how couples bond sometimes. Um, so what I did was to create a more personal version of the same question. 
So now instead of asking about rules, um, we put a little romance in there. So this is probably something more close to how you think and feel and your worries and anxieties, because that all comes out when we introduce romance or someone you want to impress. So the parameters and the context are more clear. What's going on? Who's there? What's your relationship to them? Um, it's your crush. It's Draco Malfoy. He's being a dick. Um, so, and finally, the personalization is stronger because now at least there's an implied relationship outcome. Like if your crush says, I'll defend you, and you say, don't, there's maybe some implied um, relationship change there, or you let them do it. Again, reply, implied relationship change. And this is how to get closer to maybe what the player really feels and thinks inside. And when they give the game that kind of input, they're sharing personal information. And that's how you create a connection and a bond. Um, so again, so monetization, just so you know, we do survive on monetization, and I'm not like down on it, but I, I, I think it's worth calling out that it activates a different part of the brain. And it's like an acquisitive part of the brain. It's the brain, it's part of the brain that like wants something. And you can see it, it it's often kind of um, staged that way. So here's, a, here's an example from Choices. And I like choices. I mean, I'm not down on choices or anything, but like this is a good example of kind of how, how they have to bend over backwards to make this work. So the first frame, your boss is asking you out to dinner. Like, so far, so good. Like, relationships are clear. Like, stakes are clear. Um, then you notice that the game itself has to introduce a piece of meta text to actually tell you what this choice is about. And it's not really about your love life. It's like you need access to your new boss. And then that's followed by, OK, now, do you want to buy that access? The implication is you're going to miss something if you don't. And so that's different. And it just works on a different part of the brain. And be conscious of when you mix them together, sometimes the gears can grind. Sometimes it can work. But I just want to throw that out there. So finally, uh, sharing is caring. And when I mentioned participatory art earlier, I was talking about characters and dialogue that lend themselves to sharing. And like, what I mean by that is like fan art and memes and cosplay. I mean, these are a big part of games now. And fostering that community is really important too. You want to give people something that survives really well outside of the game. Like, are your characters too visually complex to make any sense to somebody who hasn't played them? Or do you have like a cool, you know, a catchphrase that like totally works outside of the game? If someone took a snapshot of it and sent it to their friend who never played it, how well would that person kind of understand what this game was, was getting at, either in terms of humor and tone or, you know, just some funny concept? It's absolutely worth thinking about at a very early stage so that you can create something shareable. One example of this is like using really distinct costume or visual designs, something that's actually easier, easy for someone to caricature or cosplay. I mean, break it down to like, we introduced this character, Diego Kaplan, into uh, Hogwarts, and he was designed with this bright yellow Hufflepuff scarf. And like, that's something you can draw. And the blue jean jacket. And sure enough, when people went to create fan art, this is a totally different art style. They're not trying to draw Diego Kaplan in a way that you recognize him from the game. They've picked up on those visual elements. And that's what I'm talking about in terms of shareability. If you can do it in a few lines, it's more powerful because you've widened the audience of people who can then do fan art about your characters. Um, again, so for Marula Snide, she's one of the main characters, she's got this like highlight in her hair. And guess what? When people started to do fan art of Marula, that was the go-to element. Everybody picked up on it. You, you could just, once you get that, you know who she is. And it transfers into real life too. So this young lady was doing the cosplay and she got the wig and did the, the bright, um, bright highlight and boom, she's Marula. And that's the kind of thing that lowers the barrier to entry for fans who might otherwise be like, I can't replicate this costume. Well, now you can. This is easy. This is simple, and it's accessible, and go out, do it, cosplay, and spread the love for Marula. And it's not just Harry Potter. I remember when we were um, at Telltale, we were talking to Gearbox about Tales from the Borderlands, and I asked them, 
about their relationship with the fans, and they were telling me that even at the concept art stage, they think about their characters as being cosplay. Like, what body type is this good for cosplay? Or what visual element on this character is appropriate for cosplay? Can we simplify it? Can we heighten something so that people can do this and that the fans can go out there and really you know, celebrate the game instead of making it so, I don't know, maybe visually complex that it's hard to cosplay? So you can see it right here. This is Maya and, you know, she's got those three really strong visual elements, the hair, the yellow one piece, and this big old tattoo. And sure enough, you know, someone goes out to cosplay, she nailed it. You would know who she was if you were even a casual fan of Borderlands. And you can also take it to the next level. Like this is not to exclude people who really want to go bananas on the costume, but you can see there's a range here and somewhat accessible range for people at the lower end who just like maybe are more casual fans. Well, now she's a cosplay fan. Um, I don't actually know anything about this woman. She could be a totally dedicated cosplayer. But my point is creating something simple to replicate. Another thing is um, inclusive and representational characters and relationships inspire fans. So addressing and engaging underserved communities, we can do this. Like we just, just came up um, in Avengers Academy where there's a relationship between Nico and Carolina that's in the comics and they sort of have an on again, off again thing. And they, would, they wouldn't really touch this in the Avengers movie, you know? Um, I think there's some media that feels it's too big to go for this type of thing. But we can work in the so-called margins of larger IP and create and address these communities and say like, look, this, you know, you're part of this and, and draw them in. And that I got this off of a Tumblr because someone found it in the game and was so excited they posted the whole sequence where Nico asked her out on a date. She says, I have a weird question. And it's just a really cute moment that we were able to put into the game. And someone saw it, felt like included, posted it, and then that went out to all their friends. And we saw it again with um, Walking Dead, where we introduced the possibility, the choice for a player to start a relationship that Clementine and Violet could have a relationship. And we put this scene in where they have their first kiss. And of course, the community picked up on it. Immediately, the fan art started coming. And they really ran with it, and to the point where they even created their own like, name for it. So these communities, especially if they haven't been well represented in the past, can be extremely passionate if you represent them in your games and address them. And encouraging community response is key. And we do have a place in you know, Hogwarts Mystery has a Facebook page, and occasionally they ask fun questions for the fans, like, what do you think of Diego? And people just love to pop off. And they just want to have that outlet to say, I've, you know, got a crush on this character, or no way, he's totally not my crush. Like, they want to sound off, and you should give them the space to do that. Um, not only is it just fun for the fans, but we look at these responses, and we think about, well, how do we include Diego in future episodes? How should we use him? How are people feeling about him? Um, even if sometimes it's negative, they're like, well, we don't like him. So then our job is to say, oh, we should probably make Diego more likable. What's wrong with him? And starting with that fan response, again, it's that circle. It informs new content. So finally, as a, a sort of a cap on this, um, don't explain your story to death. I know it's we all get very passionate about the stories we want to tell, but I've found over and over again, it's actually really important to leave space. Don't say everything you think you need to say because the fans need to have space. They need to have um, a void that they can fill with their enthusiasm and with their imagination. Like if they can't imagine any more about your characters because you've said literally everything, again, that's not the circle. That's that's information. You're downloading data, and they're not robots, and you're not robots. And especially shippers. Shippers will, if you have two characters who have any kind of sexual chemistry, don't be tempted to have them kiss and have a relationship. You will get so much more mileage out of a wink or a look. I guarantee it. Um, and give people space to tell their own stories. Could be on forums. Um, you know, fan fiction is really powerful. But give these communities a place to, to talk 
Because remember, you can tell one story. You have time to tell one story, then you ship it, but they can tell a million. And let them tell a million. Build your stories to be accessible in that way. And I found this really cool graphic. Look at this. Look at this thing. It explains exactly what I'm talking about. I didn't even need to say anything. Um, so yeah, back to the circle. Um, it starts with you. It starts with emotional stories, character relationships, um, participatory art, compelling choices, and then on the other side, you've got the players, and they're going to give back to you. You have to give to them and make it the circle because you're going to get that connection, and you want to build to this relationship. Over time, you want to build up to this relationship. And, of course, you want to build to the payoff cat. <laughs> so important. So um, that is my presentation, and thank you. Um, we have some time for Q&A. And so I'm happy to take questions, you guys. Thank you. First off, uh, first off, thank you so much for this talk. This was one of the more pragmatic and how to sort of work in this space conversations I've seen. Um, I'd love to hear more about how do you balance choices and sort of character payoffs and dramatics alongside energy systems or upsells that might be in, ga in your game where you know you have to you know, be serving some sort of premium ec economical sort of aspect through your choices, and how do you balance making sure that both choices feel appropriate but for the character, and that players don't feel like they're being funneled away from something because they can't necessarily afford the energy at that time? Yeah, I mean, that is the tough question, right? How to do that, I think we're figuring it all out, and there's a couple of different modes. Um, choices sort of has an aesthetic where you kind of buy up front as opposed to along the way. And I think that is easier to handle narratively, like as a chunk. I think we're used to consuming media in, in chunks, whether it's a book or um, you know, a movie or something like that, where, where that pay in, payment is more for unlocking a content. Um, and formats where you sort of are interrupted with a sudden choice that comes out of nowhere and it's a monetization choice, you didn't see it coming, it can feel really abrupt. Now, obviously, they're still profitable. I'm not saying it doesn't work. I'm just, I'm wary of those because I think they break the immersion that we're trying to create and that over time, um, you start to churn people out because they're just like, well, I just don't believe the story anymore. I'm not into it. You know, you do have certain hardcore fans who just push through anyway, but I much prefer something that feels more like how we consume media like now in this world where we kind of pay for a chunk of it and the chunk tends to have a resolution included in it. Um, that's my opinion, but it's, that's the toughest question right Great. now. Thank you very much. Uh, also, thank you very much for the talk. Um, I work at Choices personally. Oh, okay, um, wow. Yeah. Well, I love Choices, by the way. <laughs> awesome. I hope I wasn't, I didn't mean to call no. anybody out. I like it. <laughs> Uh, it is very distinct, the um, trying to acquire something versus a narrative choice. Um, so I already answered some of that question. But I have more of a question on stories with grief as a primary component to them. Um, we've worked on a lot of stories dealing with romance, adventure, excitement, horror, all across the spectrum. But we're really starting to go into grief coming up. And I'm curious how you have any suggestions for that. Um, I'm, I'm making stories with grief as the main motivation for the player. And grief is a really hard one, um, and that's why I was so impressed with Lily's Garden, because grief is, grief is often seen or felt as very personal, and if you're looking at a character and they're grieving, um, and you didn't know who they're grieving for, which is often the premise of these games, you can't feel much more than empathy. You don't ever get to like true compassion. You don't feel what they feel. So grief is... Like in Walking Dead, we were able to build over five episodes to grief. Um, you got to know the character, you invested a significant amount of time in that character, and then they were killed. So if possible, that I think that's the best way to introduce it, um, because otherwise you are facing a very steep climb to get people on board. The portrayal um, 
The portrayal in Lily's Garden is interesting because it isn't the overriding concern of the story. She is trying to rebuild and, and, and it's more like a, it's very clever. She'll find the little pictures and stuff and that's like a reminder. And I feel like that at least is recognizable to a lot of us who have grief for someone or lost someone that your life returns to normal, which is how the game feels. The game feels like life is normal. And then you'll find something, you know, you'll pull a drawer open and it'll be something of theirs and, and it just floods back. And they don't linger too long on it, but it is, it is that rush of like sadness and then it fades again. And that seems to work. Um, I don't know if that works for you. Everything is so context dependent, right? Like every yeah. story is completely different, but those are the two things I've seen work. Okay. Hope that Thank helps. you so much. Yeah. <laughs> um, I heard, or basically there's an author that I uh, am a big fan of that once said that when you're building a world or essentially a story, that it's kind of like an iceberg where the amount of information you know as an author is huge, but what you actually want to tell the audience is very minimal. Um, how do you approach knowing where that line is? A great question. Um, and I think that's completely true. I think that the amount of effort that it takes, you know, it takes you eight hours to write one line sometimes where you're just like, I have to think about it that long to make sure that it makes sense and that it feels authentic and real. Um, Knowing how much to say is, is so, it's for me, as a, whoops, as a former designer, um, I put almost everything I do into the game and let it play because I never trust myself on paper. I have to see how it plays and I have to feel. And that's, I do feel my way through how much information and where it needs to sit. And it drives people crazy because I iterate constantly, but that's that's my personal method and it comes from being a designer and you know the way, same way i approach level design which is just build build scrap build again until it kind of feels right thanks hey great talk um you. so you mentioned some techniques like the the triangle and meaningful player choice that apply in narrative driven games but if you're talking about games like whether it's Panda Pop or Tycoon, like Simpsons Tapped Out, or a team RPG like Marvel Strike Force, they have a lot of narrative in those games, but you really don't have that player side of the triangle. Yeah. The player's really represented. So in that situation, where do you lean and what, what do you do? In games where sort of the player doesn't have a voice, those are really tricky. Um, I think the best you can do is reflect the choices or allocations that they might have made. You can still get the sense of your impact and that there is maybe an, an unspoken conversation um, depending on where you're allocating you know whatever assets or in the case of panda pop the the conversation is extremely simple but it is if you start fucking up mama panda begins to cry because she's worried that her babies are gonna, not going to get rescued because you suck so like <laughs> that's a conversation that you can still have and no no words are spoken um, and that really comes down to feedback, and it's not the kind of feedback we usually think of where it's like, pull the trigger and the gun does a muzzle flash. It's narrative feedback. It's the same concept, but it's with words or, or story if, if you can't use words. Um, so just thinking about maybe where you might insert feedback that might be a little bit conditionalized or, or some feedback that might be more personalized, mm -hmm. even though maybe there's no dialogue to accompany it. Cool, thanks a lot. Hey man, thanks for the talk. Uh oh, <laughs> how's it going? Um, good man. <laughs> I just had a question. In games like Hogwarts that have a lot of different characters and they all have unique traits that you said drive the story, do you have any strategies to share in introducing these characters to players that allow them to be rememberable and not overwhelm the player with names or like, who dis again? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, I mean, for Hogwarts, we rely pretty heavily on archetypes. So like if there's a character who is gonna be hard to get to know, like first of all, he's gonna be drawn so that he's like really sullen looking, right? And they're gonna communicate everything in much the same way that a sit sitcom or like, what is it? The old Italian like Commedia dell'arte or whatever, like wear, wear those archetypes on your sleeve so that's your hook. And then even if the player goes, oh yeah, I think I know what that, that archetype is or I know what that stereotype is, then you can like, 
build the layers or subvert the expectation later, but at least you got a hook where they can kind of remember, oh yeah, that guy, he's like a, he's like a sullen guy who likes to be alone, you know? Gotcha, thanks man. Sure. Hello. Hey. So I was curious on what you were talking about with the monetization in the narrative games, right? Because I've seen it before in narrative games where you have two choices and one of them is very clearly better because it's locked behind a paywall. And yeah. I know that that seems often like the most obvious way to do monetization, but it does really break immersion. What, what, I mean, what are your preferences, I guess? Like what would you, what do you think works better for getting monetization in the game, but not breaking players and reminding them that you're in a product pretty much? Um, this is a weird answer, um, but it just came to me the other day. I was watching a talk about Fallen London, and I've always admired that game from afar, but I haven't actually played it. But Olivia Wood was speaking about how they do premium content for their players, and it just the way they're approaching it seems so respectful, but also like you really got your value for your money. So. This is, this is my non-answer. I want to go play that game because it seems really interesting <laughs> and I'm very curious how they did it um, as opposed to kind of what I've seen out there where I don't think we've hit on the perfect solution for it quite yet. Yeah, thank you. Hey, so I noticed that a lot of the examples uh, for building connections used uh, romance or some elements of romance. So is romance kind of the be-all, end-all of building connections? Is there any other theme that even comes close to romance in terms of like just staying powers of building connections? Yeah, I mean romance is romance is the most accessible because it encompasses of so many ages and stages of our of our lives. You 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 know start when you're you know 13 or whatever and those early crushes and then you can get all the way into you know old age and you still have romance. So it's really accessible and really easy to adapt into a story. Um, but also, I mean, you'll see, see you'll see themes of like parentage, you know, like God of War just came out and it's like a really strong parenting story. And Lee and Clementine, like really strong sort of parenting theme. That can often be a thing that really resonates with people, whether they see themselves as the child or they see themselves as the parent. Um, and, you know, best friends can also be a really strong theme is making a new friend um, and trying to help that person and have them help you. But yeah, romance is the obvious one because it really lights up a whole bunch of parts of our brain. Um, so I think that's why you see it so often. Thank you. All right. Well, thanks again, guys, for showing up here on a 10 a.m. on a Thursday. Appreciate it. Thank you.